Welcome to our reading of Sermon 4, entitled The Divine Authority of the Scriptures by Samuel Yakum. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 You have heard that there is a God and you have had a discourse concerning the Trinity. I am now to clear and prove to you the divine authority of the Scriptures. Therefore I crave your attention to what the Scriptures report of itself in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It was motive enough to the Ephesians to plead and zealously to contend for the image of Diana because they said it was that which fell from Jupiter. Acts 19.35 Surely then you will have reason to plead for and to hold fast this blessed book which we call the Bible, if I shall be able to make it further evident that it is that book which God himself hath written, an argument which you need to hear, and which you have need seriously to consider. For as I shall in none press it upon you, if you did believe the glory the scripture speaks of, and the dreadful misery that remains for impenitent sinners in hell, if things are as they are stated in the scripture, were looked upon as real truths, it would cause you presently to return to God by godliness. There were even in the apostles' time seducers. So you find in the beginning of this chapter, persons that would resist the truth, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, not only in the present age, which is like the dregs of the world in comparison with the present times, but even then also there were seducers and deceivers. There are comets among the stars, as well as so that creeps upon the earth. What must Timothy do? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verses 14 to 15, from a child. Josephus, in his book against Apion, tells us the children of the Jews were so instructed in their laws that they could scarcely name a law to them, but they could tell it. More shame to us Christians that take no care to teach a religion that may much more easily be learned than the Jewish religion could. From a child thou hast learned the scriptures, and it should be a shame for a person so long instructed not to continue in this doctrine, a shame for an old professor, well educated, to desert the principles of his religion and forsake the truths of scripture. Do not forsake them. Why? This verse gives two reasons. First, it is of divine revelation. Secondly, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A little to explain the words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture in the text is the same with the Holy Scriptures, verse 15. For you must know that in the Bible the word scripture is commonly taken for the holy scriptures. So search the scripture, John 5.39. You do err, not knowing the scriptures, Matthew 22.29. The scripture cannot be broken, John 10.35. So you must understand it here. All scripture, that is not everything that is written, but the, but the holy scripture is of divine inspiration. The meaning is that the things written are not of human invention, are not the contrivance of any man's wit or any man's fancy, but they are the real revelations of the mind and will of God. And yet those things which were thus revealed, good men were excited to write them and assisted in it. I say the inspiration of God comprehends in it these two things. First, the truths contained in this scripture were not inventions of man's brain or fancy. Secondly, that they who wrote them were excited to it and were assisted in it by the Holy Ghost. The text is both explained and confirmed by the parallel place, knowing this first, 
that no prophecy of the scripture is of any inter- private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy 1, 20, 21. That you may a little understand this text, give me leave to gloss upon it. In verse 16, the apostle said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, etc. That which we have proposed and preached unto you was nothing cunningly devised by us when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw him transfigured. We did not go about to tell the story ourselves, but if you will not believe that, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. There are predictions concerning Christ in the Old Testament, whereunto you do very well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Verse 19. Not as some enthusiasts would interpret this, that men should mind the Old Testament till the Spirit of God should tell them the truth of this scripture and then throw away the Old Testament. No, it is a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. I will give two interpretations. Either first, that this heart is the dark place till the dark and the day star arise and so the word until shall not refer to the word take heed but only to dark place. Man's heart is, in, is the dark place. But I rather take it, till they saw the accomplishment of those prophecies, till you see that really fulfilled which has been prophesied, take heed, why? Knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, etc. So we read the word. In the Greek it is, they are not of any private incitation and impulsion. For the word hath reference to the custom of races. Now you know races do not set out when they please themselves, but when the watchword is given. Now no prophecy is of any private interpretation. They did not go about nor set about it till God really put them upon it. For it was not the effect of their own will, choice or invention, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Say the Papists, the scripture is of no private interpretation, therefore you cannot understand it. But that is just as if I should say, you must not put that what meaning you will upon my words, and therefore you cannot understand them. The scriptures being from God are not to any of, to, to any of private interpretation. That is, to put any other meaning upon them than what God means. But it does not follow that what God means cannot be understood. It is said that God spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, etc. Luke 1, 17. The apostles before they preached were endued with power from on high, as you read in Acts. Paul said of himself, it pleased God to reveal his son in him. Galatians 1, 15, 16. By the revelation of the gospel, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14.37 Question. The grand inquiry will be, how may any man be truly satisfied that this book is the word of God or that it hath divine authority or divine inspiration? Solution. I confess it is an undertaking too great for me, but yet sometimes you have seen a little boat follow a great ship. That I may distinctly do it, and offer my own thoughts in this great inquiry, I shall give you what I have to say in these three, in these seven propositions. Proposition 1. That there may be a revelation from God, no man can doubt but an atheist that thinks there is no God. That there has been a revelation from God is acknowledged by the Gentiles, 
for they looked upon their oracles as answers of their gods. And it is acknowledged also by the Jews, who tell us that Moses had their laws from God upon the mount, and all the prophets were moved and excited by God to deliver their errands to them. Since there is a God, God may make a revelation of his mind. Proposition 2. That there should be a revelation of God's mind and will, every man cannot but grant it to be highly reasonable. For alas, poor man is a sinner, a pitiful, dark, blind thing. Now he cannot but confess, though he hath no Bible, yet surely he is not what he was when he came out of God's hand. But he is now ignorant, and does not know all his duty, and is backward to do that which he does know. And if he were not backward, he could not tell whether God would accept of it or not. Therefore man cannot but say, it is a thing highly reasonable, that there should be a revelation of the will of God, that we may know his duty. And if he do it, God would take it kindly at his hand. Proposition 3. We ought to have a good satisfaction for that which we entertain as a divine revelation. For there are more persons come in God's name than have God's commission. A great many more say, thus says the Lord, than ever were bid to speak God's word. As we cannot believe, we know not what. So we cannot believe, we know not why. Whoever believes anything, he has some reason why he does believe it. Continue in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. 2 Timothy 3.14 Not those things which are concredited and trusted to thee, but those things of which thou hast been assured. Now, saith our Saviour, ye worship, ye know not what. John 4.22 Intimating that persons ought to understand what and why they worship. You are not born with this notion that this Bible is a beam of the Son of Righteousness, we must therefore see why we entertain it. That rule is excellent, though I must not, cannot give a reason of everything believed, for many things far transcend all that my short understanding is able to reach. Yet I must, and I am bound to give a reason of all that I believe, because God has said it. When the Gospel was preached, the Bereans were commended for examining whether those things were so or not. If I am satisfied that this book is God's word, I have reason enough to believe whatever is revealed. For God is too good to deceive, and too wise to be deceived. And therefore show me that, that God has said it, and that it is really God's mind. I have all the reason in the world to believe it. But now I must have some reason for which I believe that this book is a revelation of God's mind and will. Proposition 4. Where we ought to be satisfied, there it is certain God hath given minds desirous of satisfaction to see some ground for it. I mean, since it is so great a matter, we ought not to be fondly credulous. No question, but God hath given sufficient evidence of that which he would have us maintain as the manifestation of his own pleasure. For thus I argue, if we neither have nor can have anything to discern what is from God and what is not from God, then we must either resolve to believe nothing at all, or never knowing but that we may be cheated, or else believe what comes first to hand, but be it that what it will. Therefore I say, where God would have us entertain anything of his mind, it is certain he gives us sufficient evidence that it is so. I say God intended to give satisfaction to a mind that is desirous of it, not to a man that is peremptory, willful, and resolute of his own way, let God say what he will. God will not satisfy every angry Jew that will hold fast his own prejudices, nor every sensual Gentile that lives in nothing but profaneness, but an ingenious spirit that willingly gives up himself to the truth of God and lays down every prejudice and is willing to be taught by him. This is the person to whom God intends real satisfaction. Proposition 5 
all the evidence which we have of anything is either from reason or sensation, as it is impossible a man should give credit to that which can no way be made credible, so whatsoever is made credible to us, it's made so by some faculty. Now, all our faculties are either raticination or sensation, either the workings of our understanding, or else things which we feel. Believe such a thing. Why? I feel it. See it. Hear it. Proposition 6. We have rational evidence that this book, which we call the Bible, is God's word and of divine authority. Good men have inward sensations that this book is from God. Now I come to the grand business. I have told you there may be a revelation from God, since there is a God. It is highly reasonable there should be such a revelation. We ought to have satisfaction in what we entertain as a revelation of God, where we ought to be satisfied God hath given it to a mind willing to entertain it, all the evidences we can have of a thing whereby we sh should be satisfied must either be from our reason or sense. And now we have rational evidence that this book, which we call the Bible, is of divine authority. I will dwell but upon this one argument, and before I speak to it, give me leave to ask you this one question. What would you desire? give you assurance that any particular book or revelation is from God? This is a considerable question. For whatsoever a sober man could desire to give him assurance that this book is from God, he hath it. And if God say, Thou hadst all I could give thee, it would none plus all that day if they could be, fa they be found unbelievers. I can possibly desire nothing but these three things. First, Methinks whatsoever should come from God should press holiness and godliness, should press such a religion that if men love it, they should be happy by it, and should give such arguments to engage men in this religion as should be proper to persuade. Secondly, I should think that the publisher of this doctrine should himself be an exemplary person. For I could not easily imagine God would send such a person to bring in such a religion as should destroy it by his own life, and bring to ruin by his works what he has spoken with his mouth. Thirdly, I should expect such a person should work miracles to give us assurance that he had a divine commission. Now let us make an inquiry whether we have not all these things. This great argument comprehends many things in it. First, this book presses holiness and godliness so as never did any in the world before or since, and gives such arguments for it as never were heard of, nor the wit of man could have ever thought of. He that would walk in the wilderness of paganism might here and there spy a flower growing amongst many weeds. Now and then a philosopher that gives some good directions that concern righteousness and external behaviour. But the scripture is a garden wherein whatsoever hath been recommended by all the sober men in the world is put together, and wherein they were defective, that is there made up. For they were defective especially in this one great point, deep humility. And though you will find many things that concern the exercise of some Christian graces, yet in the real practice of humility, a man would wonder how incredibly they fall short. But as for the scripture, what would you have? It bids you live soberly, righteously, godly. Titus 2.12 It bids you lie at God's feet as his creature, to do with you what he will. It would have you like God himself. That is the end of the promises that we should partake of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4 It bids you be holy as God is holy. 1 Peter 1.15 It charges upon you whatsoever thing is good, is just, is lovely. Philippians 4.8 It commands your very thoughts. 
It is so far from suffering you to do hurt to your brother as not to suffer you to think hurt. It is so far from allowing to act to repine an injustice as not to allow to do anything that savors of coveting. It binds the very heart and soul. Oh, what a place of universal calmness would this world be should all serve one another in love. Should all study each other's good. We should never do injury. If any did, we should forgive him. We should endeavor to be perfect as God is. Therefore, the Jews could not but say the precepts of the gospel were wonderful, great, excellent, and transcendent indeed. Behold, the scripture is a doctrine according to godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 3. Truth according to godliness. Titus 1, 1. The mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3, 16. So that in one word, whatever God would fit man for man to do to that God that made him, whatever is fit for a sinner to do to a holy God against whom he hath transgressed, and between man and man, all that is the design of the scripture. And what the scripture thus commands, it presses by incomparable arguments. Shall I name a few? One. Behold, God is manifest in the flesh for this purpose. 1 Timothy 3.16 Is it nothing, sinner, that thou wilt live foolishly, vainly? What wilt thou think to see God dwelling in human nature? To see God live a poor, scorned, reproached, contemned life? Intimating this great truth, that it is not so unseemly a thing for the Son of God himself to live a poor, miserable life, as it is for a man to be an impenitent sinner. If you remain a willful and impenitent sinner, thou wouldest in thy pride be like God, and have no superior above thee. Behold, God condescends and becomes like to thee, that if possible he might bring thee back again. Thou that art a sinner, suspectest whether God will do thee good, behold how close he comes to thee. He dwells in thy own nature. 2. Behold the beloved Son of God dying upon the cross for thee. What would you think if any of your parents should suffer their child to die in the behalf of an enemy? Would you not think it should move that enemy? Behold, my son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 Methinks God take not a quarter of that content in the whole creation which he does when he speaks of his son. Yet this son suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3.18 They think this love should constrain us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 Poor soul, thou art ready to drink, think God is become thine enemy. When sickness and death comes, thou art ready to say, thou hast, hast thou found me, O my enemy? Here is trouble in the world. How shall I know whether God intends good? Behold, it is beyond peradventure. God intends good to a sinner because he dwelt in our nature and his son died for us and his son felt pain and infirmity and therefore he may love thee and you need not question anything of this nature is a hindrance of God's love. The case of a sinner is not so desperate but that a man may be accepted and loved of God for Christ's sake. Will not this move you? 3. You have promises of eternal life and threatenings of eternal misery. Never did any philosopher or any other man threaten if you will not observe such and such precepts, I will throw you into eternal torments. Nor ever did any man say, I will give you such glory in heaven, but the scripture does. Behold, life and immortality are brought to light by Christ. 2 Timothy 1.10 There is a future resurrection and this body is like an old house pulled down. By and by it will be a brave building again, a spiritual body. And we shall shine like the sun in the firmament and be equal to the angels of God. Matthew 13.43 And be like God and Christ. 
Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. And having this hope, who would not purify himself, even as God is pure? 1 John 3, 3. Who would not live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, Titus 2, 12 and 13. If you did but apprehend this glory, were not your mind senseless? Is it impossible you could be quiet without getting an interest in it? And how great the day of judgment will be, it tells you. How our thoughts, words and actions, and everything we go about, shall come under a severe scrutiny. 4. The work of our souls. We mind our bodies, but a soul is better than a world. The scripture says the Son of God died for souls. We never understand stood so much that what souls were worth as now we do, when we see God taking such care and having such designs and thoughts from all eternity. 5. The fairest and most reasonable condition of eternal happiness and the greatest strength to perform it, that is offered in the gospel. Suppose we were sensible, we would, were liable and obnoxious to God's wrath, and could go to heaven and beseech God that he would be pleased not to execute that wrath upon us, but do you do but think what terms you would be willing to propose to God? Would you come and say, Lord, punish me not for what is past, though I intend to do the same thing? But he that should say, Lord, forgive me. I am sorry for what for that which is done, and it shall be the business of my life to live more circumspectly to thee. This is a great thing which the scripture proposes to us. Godliness in the scripture hath the promise of the things of this life and of things to come. 1 Timothy 4, 8 Whatever is good here we are sure of it in the practice of piety, and in the world to come, are sure of that happiness. But no more can tell what it is than we can tell what the thoughts of all men have since be, been since the first creation. What arguments can you imagine possibly God himself could propose, greater or stronger than these? What should hinder me from returning to God? That is the first part of the demonstration. Secondly, we should expect the publisher of this doctrine should himself be exemplary. And so is Christ. Austin said the whole life of Christ was doctrinal to lead us to piety and good practice. He went up and down doing good. Did any reproach him? He reproached them not again. Was he reviled? He reviled not again. 1 Peter 2.23 When he came to suffer, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Luke 22:42. There is not such a word as that in all the pieces of philosophy, not such an expression of humility and surrender. Father, not my will, etc. An innocent person. So said the text. He is always denying himself. He will not be rich and great in the world. Why? Because he pressed you to lay up treasures in heaven, he hath not a hole where to lay his head. Why? Because he bids you to live upon God's providence. He lived a single life, because he would have you be as though you had not such and such relations. His very enemies could object nothing against him. Have nothing to do with that just person, said Pilate's wife, Matthew 27:19. I find no fault in him, saith he that condemned him. John 18, 38, 19, 4 and 6. Not the Jews themselves were ever able to have instance in any evil practice. They only charged him, and so do still, that he wrought miracles by the devil. 
which was the greatest miracle, but they never could charge him with any evil practice. Leaving us an example, 1 Peter 2.21 Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. Matthew 11.29 Now what servant would not be willing to do that which his master does before him? Thirdly, we should expect that he should work miracles to testify that he had his commission from God. For he that shall come to set up a new law, a new economy, a new frame and constitution of religion, had need assure us that he is God's messenger. If he work miracles, he cannot tell what to have more. For we certainly conclude that God will not suffer a long series of things, extraordinary and quite beyond the course of nature, to be done to attest a lie. Miracles were begun by our Saviour, and continued many hundred years after, just as props that are set under weak vines, so these under the weak faith of the world when it first began. One said excellently that those whom the speaking tongue did not convince, the seeing eye might certainly convince. That these were proper to convince that Christ came from God appears from Matthew 11.3.4, where when John sent to know, Art thou he that should come, that is, Art thou the Messiah, it is answered, Go and show John those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. John 3, 2-5 Nicodemus saith, No man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. John 3, 2 And the blind man saith, He hath opened mine eyes. And how come you to ask how he did it? John 9, 25, 27 Great signs shall follow them that believe. Mark 16, 17 and these continued in Justin Martyr's, Tertullian's, Cyprian's time, Gregory Nissen's time, and some part of Chrysostom's time. 1. Concerning these miracles, give me leave to lay down three propositions. Then you will see the strength of the whole argument. 1. They were famous and illustrious, for they were done before multitudes. Matthew 9.8 and 12, 22 to 33, not done in a corner, Acts 26, 26, and John 9, when Lazarus was raised, they said they could not deny it. At his Christ's death, the earth quaked, the temple rent, there was darkness for three hours, which was observed by heathens as well as Christians. 2. As they were done before a multitude, so there were a multitude of miracles, insomuch that John said, they were so many, that if all should be written, the world could not contain the books that should be written, John 21, 25. That is a hyperbolical expression for a very great number. A learned man had observed that Elisha did but twelve miracles. Elijah did not, did not so many. Moses wrought about seventy-six, and they which were done by them, and all the rest of the prophets from the beginning of the world to the destruction of the first temple, amounted but to one hundred and fifty miracles. In three thousand three hundred and twenty-eight years, there were not, as we find in Scripture, so many wrought. But now Christ went about healing all manner of sickness, and curing all manner of diseases, Matthew 4, 24, and Acts 10, 38. Questionless, a very vast number. 3. They were all of all sorts and of all kinds. A woman that had an issue of blood 12 years, Matthew 9, 20. And a woman that had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, Luke 13, 11 and one that had an infirmity 38 years, John 5, 5-9, to 
the dead were raised, the devils were cast out, the sea commanded, the winds obey. They are of all sorts and kinds. Observe also this, that you do not read or find anything that there was the least of them done out of any ostentation. There is no such thing done by Christ or his apostles to, to call men out and say, Come, I will show you what I can do. That should show any kind of arrogant affectation to themselves. But the greatest humility and modesty runs through all the exercise of this mighty power. And this practice was ordinary among the common professors then. Yea, the Galatians, they received that spirit by which miracles were wrought among themselves. 2. Such famous miracles were a sufficient ground to make men believe this holy doctrine who saw the miracles wrought by them that preached it. For if they did not, it must be either because they questioned whether things were done or whether done by God or not. They could not question whether the things were done for they saw some raised out of their graves, etc., nor could they question whether this was from God or not. For observe, where I see miracles wrought, there I am bound to believe that they get testimony to what is preached by him that works them, except that which is preached is that of which I am infallibly ensured already that it cannot be true. Except does God does by some great mir- greater miracle contradict the testimony of those miracles, as now the Egyptians, they wrought miracles, but God contradicted all their testimony by Moses. Now observe, the end of all Christian religion is to preach truth, to glorify God, to honour God, to save a man's soul. Never was there any exerting of God's power to contradict it. So if a man may not believe a doctrine thus holy, a doctrine thus practiced by him that published it, and confirmed by miracles, then a man is under an impossibility of ever being satisfied from anything from God. For what shall satisfy? If God speak to us from heaven, we should as much suspect that as if an angel came from heaven, we should suspect him. But since we believe and know there is a God, and he is just and merciful, it is impossible that divine goodness should consent to such impostors. But you will say, What are these miracles to us? 3. I say, therefore, thirdly, they are of a sufficient reason to engage us to believe the divinity of this Holy Scripture, though we never saw them. You do not see Christ yourselves, nor did you see him die, nor work miracles, but would you have had Christ live always among you? If you would, he must then never die, and the greater great comfort of our life depended upon his death. He died, is risen, and gone to heaven. Would you have him come down from heaven and die, that you may see it? And would you have him die quite through the world at the same time? Which must be, if you would imagine, we must see everything ourselves. It is a great piece of madness to believe nothing but what we see ourselves. Austin was troubled himself in this case. He had been cheated before, and now he was resolved he would believe nothing but what would be plain to him. And then, says he, O my God, thou showest me how many things I believed which I saw not. I considered, I believed I had a father and a mother, and such persons were my parents. How can I tell that? A man may say, it may be he was dropped from heaven, and God made him in an extraordinary way. So if I never were out of this town, it's madness for a man to say, there is never another town in England, or to say, there is no sea, because I saw it not. Nay, if a man come and tell me, there is doctrine that teaches me all self-denial, mortification, weanedness from the world, and say this of God, and when he hath done ventures, life, children, family, have we not reason to believe it? If you are not believed, it is either because the first persons were deceived themselves, or else because you think they would deceive you. Now, deceived themselves they could not be, when they saw so many miracles done, and deceive you that they would not neither. 
For would any good man deceive to deceive another and do himself? They died for it and wrote this book and sealed it with their blood. And therefore there can be no reason to doubt of it. They were witnesses and delivered what they saw. Luke 1, verse 2. Proposition 7. As we have rational evidence that the scripture is the word of God, so we have evidence also from inward sensation. Born we are with principles of conscience, and the truths in this book are so homogeneal to man that he shall find something within himself to give testimony for it. But the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, 2 Corinthians 4.2. Men believe not, because they receive honour of another. John 5.44 And in scripture, they would not believe. Are they, are they that would not repent? Matthew 21.28.32 Men that practice drunkenness, whoredom, sensuality, covetousness, pride, and know that these things are sins, they are the great unbelievers, because they are loath to leave their sins offer the greatest reason in the world for a thing. If it be against a man's interest, how hard and almost next to impossible it is to convince him. A man would believe that the Romans were in England that read the Roman history, but if he shall find the coin of the Roman emperor, he will much more believe it. Do a bad action. Oh, the secret terrors that a man finds within him, as if he felt something of hell already do a good action, and the secret sweetness, joy, and peace that attends it, that he cannot but say, I believe it, but I feel some degrees of it already. 1 Corinthians 14, 24, 25, etc. He speaks to the inward principles of his conscience. The reason men believe not the scriptures is not because it is unreasonable to believe them, but because they have a desperate love to sin, and they are loath to entertain that, that should check their interest. There is in every life that certain sagacity by which a man apprehends what is natural to that life, what nourishes that life. A man that lives according to the law written in his heart finds there is that in this revelation that feeds, nourishes, and encourages, so that this man finds experimental satisfaction in it. Does the word of God tell me the ways of God are pleasant? I thought they were hard and difficult. Now I find the yoke of Christ is easy, and that no happiness like this, and no blessedness like that. I thought if I did not comply with such things, I could never be blessed. Now I feel I need nothing to make me happy but my God. He finds and feels these things are certain, true, and real. Thus I have done with the demonstration. You will easily observe that I have neither taken notice of what the papists tell us, we must believe the scriptures because the church said it, seeing we cannot tell what the church is till the scripture hath told us. And though I have not mentioned the testimony of the Spirit, yet I suppose I have spoken to the thing, for I cannot understand what should be meant by the testimony of the Spirit except we either mean miracles wrought, which in scripture is called the testimony of the Spirit of Christ, Acts 15, 8, 9, the giving of the Holy Ghost. It is a giving of those extraordinary miracles that fell down among them. So Hebrews 2, 4, and Acts 5, 32. I say, if by the testimony of the Spirit you mean this, then you can mean nothing else but the Spirit assisting, enabling, helping our faculties to see the strength of that argument which God hath given us, and by experience to feel what may be felt, which comes under the head of sensation. Application. First, then study the scriptures. If a famous man do but write an excellent book, oh, how do we long to see it? Or suppose I could tell you that there is in France or Germany a book that God himself wrote. I am confident men may draw all the money out of your purses to get that book. You have it by you. Oh, that you would study it. 
when the eunuch was riding in his chariot. He was studying the prophet Isaiah. He was not angry when Philip came, and as one would have thought, asked him a bold question. Understandest thou what thou readest? Acts 8, 27-30. He was glad of it. One great end of the year of release was that the law might be read. Deuteronomy 31, 9-13. It is the wisdom of God that speaks in the scripture. Therefore, whatever else you mind, really and carefully study this Bible. Secondly, in all inquiries into the truth of the mind of God, consult those sacred oracles. Hear our minds of truth. O oh, dig here, make them the rule of faith and life. While a papist makes the church his rule, and the enthusiast pretends to make the spirit of God his rule, do you live by scripture? Consider what I say. Consider there is thy duty. What I say, there is the scripture. Yet Timothy was as good a man as any of us, and the Lord give me understanding. There is the work of the spirit to assist our faculty, 2 Timothy 2.7. But how shall I find out truth by scripture? For thy own satisfaction, remember this. Have an explicit faith in all that plainly appears to be God's mind. And have an implicit faith, resolving to be of God's mind in all the rest. Be it what it will be, believe it, because it appears to be of God. While a person resolves to be of the church's mind, be thou of God's mind. Only use all means whereby thou mayest come to know it, to wit. 1. Take heed of passion and sensual lusts. We read of some that will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers. 2 Timothy 4, 3. A lust or passion is like a whirlpit. A man is sucked up into it. Ambition, sensuality, any of these darken and blind a man's mind. When a man studies anything, the mind had need to be quiet. Lusts and passions are always busy and boisterous, and make a man have a great interest against God. 2. Beware of prejudice. Christ said, Go preach to all nations. Matthew 28:29. But Peter lived under prejudice, and he said, Lord, I never ate anything common or unclean when God bade him go to the Gentiles. Acts 10.14 3. Beware of taking truth upon the authority of men, for that is fallible. Modesty requires you should have a fair respect to preachers and the church of God where you live. But as to the vitals of your religion, do not take them upon authority. Though a man would not willingly deceive you, yet he may be deceived himself in things controverted. In plain things of scripture, that we must be humble, holy, believe, repent. All the world should not persuade you out of your religion, and as for your duty, you understand it. Never and one but knows what he is to love when God bids us love him. If we would but familiarize our religion, we, we would, could not but understand it. But in matters wherein there is a dispute and controversy in the world, be quiet and sober, not confident that such and such things must need to be so, because such say so. Many pretend a kind of sanctity, and pretend for God, and the ship may carry very broad sails, but not very well laden. But this it is. One man draws a multitude, and then a multitude prevails upon particular persons, and shall I go against the multitude? I say, therefore, take not things upon authority. See and examine for thyself. If it be plain in Scripture, mind it and own it, and charge thyself with it. If it be obscure, think. If no farther concern thee, then God hath made it manifest. 4. Beware of idleness. Search the Scriptures. John 5.39 Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2.7 They that are busied for veins of silver, they hold the rod evenly poised in their hand, till at length it moves in that vein where it lies in the earth. So hold your souls, 
even in a diligent inquiry into the scriptures. Five. Beware of pride. The humble man God will teach. Proud men scorn others. They will not be taught. And pride, that will make a man to neglect prayer. Six. Charge yourselves with that which is the end of the scripture, to live well. What would go about, who would go about to read a piece of law that he may learn mathematics, or read the statutes to learn logic? You may as well do so as read the scripture to talk only. But the intent of the scripture is to show how you ought to live godly, to be just, righteous, sober, to act by rule. Nothing hinders knowledge so much as a bad life, for sin brought in ignorance, and holiness will bring in the best light. There is a great deal of difference betwixt wit and wisdom. Many have parts enough to be witty, but none but sober and conscientious persons will have true wisdom. A scorner seeketh wisdom, and findeth it not. Proverbs 14.6 Scorners usually are witty men, men of brave parts. A man that hath a mind only to practice wit is never satisfied in the things of God. If any man do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. John 7.17 7, There are a thousand things disputed in the world, errors upon errors. But I thank God it is plainly revealed that God hath mercy for a sinner in Christ. I understand well what it is to live soberly, righteously, godly. I know what it is to honour my parents, and do in my relations what becomes me, and I know these are the conditions of eternal happiness. I can but use all human endeavours, I can but beg of God, and charge myself to love what I know, so that I am able to say at the day of judgment, what appeared to be in the mind of God, I observed it. What did not appear, I used all means to understand it. I would not hastily determine myself till I saw thy mind, because I knew there were impostors. And if this be done, if men will wrangle and make them travesties where God hath made none, let them. For there will be no end of vanity and folly. Thirdly, seek daily that your belief may be strengthened, that this book is of divine authority. For what will enable you to resist temptation if you do not believe the scripture? I write unto you, young men, said the apostle, because ye are strong. Why? The word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the evil one. 1 John 2.14 You will never be strong and overcome the evil one but by virtue of the word of God. If sin tempts you, if you look into the scripture, there is peace, good conscience, the joy of God, and eternal life. And shall I, for a trifle, lose these? No. While we have scripture, we have an antidote against all the devil's poison. Again, what will bear you up under any of your afflictions if you lose the belief in the scriptures? You will need it when you come to be sick and die. When you bury your friends and relations, what will satisfy a man's mind? There is an afterglory. When friends come after me, or go before me, we shall all meet in joy. Did I but believe this glory, as I believe, when the sun sets, it will rise again. Were I but persuaded that what God has said is true, as now I am persuaded that I speak, how should I long for this glory? How would every child wail for his inheritance? How full of prayers? How cheerful in our spirits? How should we welcome death? How should we long till these tabernacles of dust were crumbled to nothing? When affliction comes, how shall I rejoice in that I believe that all shall work for good, because I love God? With that quiet spirit, should I pass through the great wilderness of this world? The devil knows that if he can but beat you from this fort, he will quickly beat you out of all other forts. Let the word of God come to you with much assurance. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5 With a full assurance and understanding. Colossians 2, 2 You must not understand that there he speaks in reference to their persons to assure them that they were the children of God 
but that their faith had a good foundation in itself, that this was from God, the truth of a good assurance in judgment. Take this farther advice. If you would keep up your faith, be true to your faith. Be sure you live well. You will always find men make shipwreck of a good conscience and a faith together. 1 Timothy 4.10, 21, 2 Timothy 3.8, and 1 Timothy 1.19. Remember the Apostle's advice. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12.2 Never fear it. While thy mind is but willing to be ruled by God, while thy soul is teachable and tractable, this will give thee evidence that this book is from God. Except melancholy overcome thee, which leads men to be sceptics. Except in that case which is the proper effect of a man's body and must be cured by physic. Let a man have a mind to live well and to be ruled by the word The Bible is the best thing in the world to such an one. I might have spoken to a case of conscience concerning the assent of Christians to the word of God, that it is not equal in all, nor equally in the same persons always, and that a man may really believe that in the general of his life, which at some particular times he may doubt of, and a man may not be fully satisfied in the truth of the scriptures, yet that man may really live under the power of it. To conclude all with this, since we have this reason to believe the scripture is God's word, then never wonder that you find ministers, parents, masters, to press real piety upon you, and see what great reason you have to entertain it. Alas, it may be, you wonder we preach and press religion. We are verily persuaded that if you do not love this religion, you will be intolerably miserable. And we have so much compassion for you that since we know this to be God's word, better be to be burned in the hottest fire than to lie in those torments. We know, since God has said it, that there is no comfort too great to them that comply with it, no judgment too terrible to those that will oppose it. Therefore you cannot wonder if we do from day to day press it upon you. Consider If it be God's word, then the threatenings are true, then the promises are true, and you shall either have the promises or the threatenings within a while. God knows which of us shall be next. For it is but a little while before death and judgment come, then either come ye blessed, or go ye cursed. As a man hath wrought, so he shall have. For he will render to every man according to what he hath done in the flesh. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade you, 2 Corinthians 5.11. We know this is a divine stamp and authority. I conclude all with, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Acts 20.32 This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com by phone at 780-450-3730 by fax at 780-468-1096 or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue Edmonton that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N Alberta 
abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.